with uh, Dr. Oriola Salvaki. She was at Family Ruskin in Chelmsford in the UK. Our research deals with uh, innocence compensation, which is to say compensation for those who in fact end up being exonerated. So we are dealing with those that very small percentage of people who uh, are successful in their efforts to in fact be found not guilty to a great degree. Um, and, the top, and what we're talking about is basically how difficult it is even after you get to that point where you are in, in that infinitesimal small number of people who actually do get exonerated, you know, how do you in fact then become compensated for what are egregious losses as a function of the harms caused by errors in the criminal justice system. Uh, our research involves three uh, essential elements. It's primarily a comparison between the remedies that are available in the common law jurisdictions uh, as compared to those in the civil law traditions. Uh, the first part of the research is very straightforward traditional doctrinal research looking at the legal analysis between those two systems. And then the second part of the research deals with uh, participant interviews. So we in fact will interview those who have gone through the process to get the rich data that should give us with respect to their experiences. Uh, what I'm presenting today is I've done the, uh, the uh, traditional doctrinal analysis of the common law jurisdictions. That's, uh, that's my uh, expertise. Uh, these four areas are where you find compensation uh, against the state. It's going to be found in either tort liability, uh, constitutional claims, uh, statutory uh, relief, and what's called non-statutory schemes or ex gratia. Uh, when we talk about relief against the state, we're talking fundamentally about claims against either police forces or services or Crown Prosecution Services. Those are the two uh, bodies of the state, state actors that have the carriage of prosecutions and the investigation of crimes. And so if a mistake is going to be made, it is more than likely going to be made either by the police or by the Crown. All right? Sometimes there's ineffective defense counsel, but that's not part of our study. All right, with respect to tort liability of the state, the uh, first place we're going to look at is essentially the law of negligence. All right? the law of negligence being by far and away the, uh, the largest occurrence of uh, tort liability uh, at law. And uh, we're going to talk about this young lady. Her name is Jacqueline Hill. Some of you may be familiar with her. She was quite famous. Uh, excuse me, I'm just going to read through the facts of the case. I want to get them right for you. So <clears throat> Jacqueline Hill, age 20, was a third year English student at the University of Leeds on November the 17th, 1980. That evening, she attended a probation office seminar at the Leeds City Center and then caught a bus to take her home. At 9.23 p.m., she disembarked from the bus and commenced the walk to her residence approximately 30 meters away. At the same time, Peter Sutcliffe was sitting in his car, parked outside the shopping center, eating a meal of Kentucky Fried Chicken. Upon seeing this hill, Sutcliffe turned on the ignition and drove just past her. He then got out of his car and followed her for a short distance before delivering a blow to her head with a hammer. Once Sutcliffe was confident he could not be seen, he tore off her clothes and stabbed her repeatedly with a screwdriver in the chest and one eye. At the scene of the initial attack at the front of the Arndale Mall, another student found a purse with what appeared to be blood and called the police. They attended and the members of the West Yorkshire Constabulary performed a rather cursory search but found nothing. However, the next morning, an employee of the shopping center found Jacqueline Hill's body and who, and who would become the last known victim of the Yorkshire Ripper. Ms. Hill's mother sued the Chief Constable of West Yorkshire, claiming on behalf of Ms. Hill's estate damages for the negligent investigation by the police force into the identity and apprehension of Sutcliffe. The plaintiff claimed that with respect to the 13 murders and eight attempted murders of women within the geographic area of the attack, it was reasonable to infer that all were committed by the same man and that it was foreseeable that if he was not apprehended, he would commit further offenses of the same nature. The pleadings alleged that the police force was required to use its best endeavors and exercise all reasonable care and skill to apprehend the culprit and thereby protect members of the public who might otherwise be his future victims. As it turned out, the West Yorkshire Police made several mistakes in this investigation. There was an inquiry into this. Uh, Sutcliffe had been interviewed nine times prior to his eventual arrest. 
but the nature of the paper filing system used at the time made cross-referencing difficult and very ineffective. The force ignored a tip-off from an associate of Sutcliffe that stated unequivocally that Sutcliffe, in fact, was the Yorkshire Ripper and that he provided his name, address, and place of employment. It was not until January 2nd of 1981 when Peter Sutcliffe was stopped by the police in the presence of a prostitute that following questioning and a search of his residence, he confessed to being the Yorkshire Ripper. All right. And what this case stands for is the House of Lords in this claim basically deny the petition of uh, the uh, Jacqueline Hill mother on behalf of the estate, denied liability on basis that there was not sufficient proximity between Jacqueline Hill as a woman in the geographic area of the attacks and to provide a duty of care by the police to these women in the area. All right. Importantly, and beyond the very standard tort test of duty of care, the uh, court went on to say that the imposition of civil liability on the police for failing to protect members of the public from injuries inflicted by unknown criminal third parties would result, and this is very important, in a significant diversion of police manpower and attention from their most important function, that of the suppression of crime, and that the core principle, and this is referred to as the Hill core principle, was the fact that there is a blanket immunity to police with respect to their investigations. For the purposes of our research, which is in fact the duty of police to in fact investigate properly when they're dealing with a suspect in a crime, not a third party, we have the following year the decision of Calvary versus the Chief Constable of Merseyside basically saying that it would be a preposterous proposition to think that the police had a duty of care with respect to suspects being investigated. Twenty years later, and again this is a comparative piece of work, in 2007 in the Supreme Court of Canada, the Hill decision, the Hill Court Principles and Calvary were argued in, uh, in Ottawa uh, in a case with the coincidental name of Hill called Hill versus Hampton Wentworth where the Supreme Court of Canada in fact did hold that there is a duty of care of the police to in fact properly investigate crimes. There was a duty of care to suspects in that situation so in fact the police were not liable or not uh, immune from liability uh, to the uh, suspects being investigated and importantly and in direct contrast to the UK Hill decision and Calvary, the Supreme Court of Canada basically held that there were no policy considerations that would provide an immunity to police or negate a liability for police and in fact the Chief Justice of the uh, court in Hill versus Hampton Wentworth went so far as to say that you know we in fact believe as a court that it is a policy, it would be good policy, to in fact impose liability on the police because we think that liability will in fact prompt them to investigate in a better fashion. It will raise the standard of care. And that's the position in Canada, right, contrary to the UK. Now, obviously in the UK with the uh, enactment of the Human Rights Act 1998 coming into force in 2000, we had basically the imposition or, or application of the European Convention of Human Rights right, to take into account and this in fact has had an impact upon the uh, liability of the state with respect to police investigations and in the decision of Osmond versus the United Kingdom in 1998 the European Court basically said that as a function of Article 6 of the Convention that in fact the Hill exclusionary or blanket immunity rule uh, should not apply any longer, and in fact the police in the UK do have an obligation to investigate properly, all right? and that includes investigations for third parties and potentially suspects. All right? um, however, having said that, clearly there is a difference between a human rights case and cases at common law, and in the most recent case of the Commissioner of Police of Metropolis versus DSD, which was only it's about six weeks old, the Supreme Court again said that police can be liable in proceedings with respect to now Article 3 of the Convention prohibiting inhuman and degrading treatment, basically indicating that they do have to perform, they have an obligation for an adequate criminal investigation. But having said that, all that is really required is that the police properly secure evidence, 
right? They deal, they deal, deal, with, deal with promptness and with a reasonable expectation of doing it properly, but the standard of care is no more than gross negligence. Right? And so that's, and that in fact is an incredibly difficult standard to meet. If you were going to be suing a police force or a crown, a crown <coughs> prosecution service, which is the other side of the coin, and you have to come up to this particular standard of care, right, you will have an incredibly difficult time. As a matter of fact, the House of Lords, when it comes to Crown Prosecution Services, has pretty much imposed a blanket immunity without even this lower standard. Okay, so that's the tort liability of the state. When it comes to other avenues, the one that is most highly recognized as the most transparent and principled is when jurisdictions put into place statutory schemes for compensation. There are two jurisdictions that we study that does this. One is the United States, and the other one, in fact, is the UK. Uh, there is no statutory, statutory scheme in Canada. There's none in Australia. There's none in New Zealand. So these two jurisdictions. With respect to the US, there are 30 American states that provide for compensation, together with the District of Columbia and the federal government. Uh, the, the, the states themselves are free to enact legislation as they see fit. So there's a wide, a very wide variety on the relief that's available. So there's differences uh, from state to state with respect to initial eligibility requirements, the amount of the awards, questions of factual innocence, burdens of proof, behavior of the claimant contributing to the conviction, prior criminal history, and what have you. So we have at the one end of the scale in Wisconsin, we have basically a maximum of $5,000 per year for wrongful incarceration to a maximum total of $25,000. Right, so that's at the bottom end of the scale. And one of the better jurisdictions, to our surprise, is Texas, right? a highly active capital state. Uh, so Texas will pay you upwards of $100,000 a year if you happen to be on death row. There is no uh, cap on that total award. So our opinion uh, <coughs> in this particular slide is, if they don't kill you, they'll pay you. <laughs> uh, in the UK, the UK up until relatively recently was seen to in fact have one of the best drafted compensation statutes in the common law world. Right? It was a function of section 133 of the Criminal Justice Act of 1988, which in fact provides for an enforceable right to compensation if you meet the terms of the uh, statute. And in fact, <clears throat> the provision up until relatively recent uh, amendments very closely mirrors Section 14.6 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. It's almost word for word, or it was until it was amended, right? However, in 2014, the Act was amended, basically, and this proviso was entered into it that now, if you were going to be claiming under Section 133, you had to have a new or newly discovered fact that showed beyond a reasonable doubt that you were factually innocent. Right? The burden of doing that is infinitesimally impossible. First off, you have to meet the criminal standard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt right, in a civil proceeding, right? and then to prove your own factual innocence, right, which in many cases is proving a negative, uh, the chances of doing that are next to nothing. Right? In 2016, the uh, matter of the interpretation of this newly amended provision uh, came before the UK Court of Appeal in Newland and Hallam, right? which basically, again, was looking at section 133, now violate Article 6 sub 2 of the Convention. Article 6 sub 2 is the right <coughs> uh, to be innocent unless proven guilty, right? a very standard due process right. right. So that was the question before the court. Did section 133 require the Secretary of State which is where you make your applications under Section 133. So they require the Secretary of State to, in fact, deal with innocence in that it engages Article 6.2 of the Convention. And Lord Dyson basically said this. He held that one, Section 133, in fact, was compatible with the Convention, right? In that the Secretary of State, looking at the question of whether the claimant met the, uh, the wording of Section 133, only engaged his or her innocence generally. And as a function of that, uh, held that in fact, uh, Section 133 did not contravene the Convention. Uh, that's troublesome in a, from a number of perspectives. There are two prior uh, Supreme Court decisions, uh, Adams and Allen, that conflict with that. And so the UK Supreme Court last year, last April, gave permission for an appeal to go forward. Right? So in fact, now 
the UK Supreme Court is going to be dealing with does the amended Section 133 uh, contravene Article 6.2 of the Convention? This is at the heart of our research with respect to comparative systems because if the, if the Supreme Court of the UK, in fact, does agree that the Convention has been breached, then we are talking about the presumption of innocence being at play in all circumstances, which would make Section 133 of the Criminal Justice Act of 1988 pretty much a strict liability provision, which means if you're found not guilty, you're exonerated in any means, then you have a enforceable right to compensation. Right? So it it, it, you know, we're looking at this obviously very closely. It could be, in fact, a very important provision. Right? Uh, and the last recourse that we have with respect to the ways to seek compensation is by virtue of what's called the Royal Prerogative of Mercy. Right? So it's something that's been around for centuries in all jurisdictions. Right? All the common law jurisdictions that we've studied have always had this provision. It involves basically engaging the executive of the government, so it's the cabinet, essentially, in most jurisdictions. So you make basically you have an application to the cabinet to ask for a political solution to compensation. Right? So that the very terms of it are incredibly limiting. It's called ex gratia in that the state, if they in fact do pay you under the scheme, is doing it out of grace. They're not doing it out of any legal liability. That's the position all the governments take. Right? Um, again, all common law jurisdictions have this, except the UK. The UK had it, obviously, for centuries. However, in 2006, it rescinded it. Right? So for whatever reason, the UK said, you know what? We're happy with Section 133 of the Criminal Justice Act. We no longer need to have the Home Secretary at the time bothered with these kind of things. And it was removed, right? And one author, who is uh, Professor John Spencer of Cambridge, basically looking at now the fact that the expiration scheme is gone and looking at the fact that Section 133 has now been so narrowly amended, basically takes the position that the compensation uh, for miscarriages of justice in the UK is as close to non-existent as possible. Um, if, in fact, this had been in place at the time of compensation for the Guilford 4, the Birmingham 6, the Cardiff 3, which in fact our cases where compensation was paid under the expiration scheme, they would not see a dime today. None of those miscarriages of justice would be recognized. Uh, Canada has an expiration scheme in place since 1988 with the enactment of what are called Federal, Provincial, and Territorial Guidelines. Again, it's an executive application to the Attorney General in whichever province the uh, miscarriage of justice takes place. Over the years, millions of dollars, in fact, have been paid out of this scheme. I did, but again, it's incredibly political. The only people who, in fact, are ever compensated for these kind of things tend to be the ones that get tremendous amounts of publicity. So in Canada, it was uh, people like uh, Stephen Truscott, David Milgard, Dean Paul Moran, very famous cases, the equivalent of the uh, Guilford Four kind of things. Um, there have been 25 payouts of, the, uh, of this kind of thing in the last 30 years since the imposition of the guidelines, but only one in the last five. So they've fallen off the, off the table as well. Right? New Zealand, in fact, has a actually quite a good and robust non-statutory scheme. It's published online, it's available to potential claimants, and in fact, it allows for, it starts at $100,000 a year for claimants, and uh, it has a tariff, so it's a per year basis, and going forward, uh, in fact, it has a fairly decent record of payment, right, which is certainly superior to anything that we have in the remaining common law jurisdictions. With respect to civil law jurisdictions, and this is the work that Dr. Salavaki is doing in our research, her comparative study at this point shows that in fact, uh, the availability of compensation is more robust in civil law jurisdictions. It's more principled. It certainly, <coughs> thought, it, uh, it certainly relies upon much more uh, on human rights obligations, DCHR and what have you, all right? Compensation tends to be available irrespective of failure or fault on behalf of the police or the Crown. And in fact, there's not a global requirement for factual innocence, so Article 6, the presumption in the Convention, is pervasive. Right? So this is, this is obviously important for our uh, research, and these are the jurisdictions that, that we are looking at from the civil law tradition. So they are from Albania to Spain, okay, so all those jurisdictions are being studied. Right? And then the last uh, bit of our research is going to be participant interviews with those who have been involved in the compensation project 
or process, I'm sorry. So in the common law jurisdictions, we'll be dealing, talking to people who have applied in the UK and Canada, and in civil law, jurisdictions in France, Germany, and the Netherlands.